don't know why in the hell I feel like singing happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy. It's nobody's birthday, but that damn song is stuck in my head. That's crazy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Why did I just forget the, uh, the number to the call in? What's the number? Um, 433, right? 933. Three. Okay, that's it. I just had a. Oh, okay. Cause we, I can't remember that. <laughs> off the top of my head. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, y'all. What's up? Where y'all at? Coming to the room. You know, my phone might be tripping. Oh, we got two viewers. All right, Black Power Comrade, Chikonze, Black Power Comrade, Valencia. Y'all make sure y'all go ahead and share. Put hashtag shared in the comments when you have shared the live stream for the Revolutionary Book Trap. You know it's again another day, another Sunday. We're going to bring you political education the right way. Make you say ho, ho, hey, hey. That's right. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> Black Power Comrade, Robert. Y'all make sure y'all share, 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 share. Uh, today is going to be a great show episode, like always. Um, yeah, so y'all make sure y'all come on. It's Sunday. We got to get this political education out to our brothers and sisters. How you feeling today, Comrade Knight? You feeling okay? I feel good. Feel it's like cold, that? but I feel good. Yes, ooh, show them your hair. Y'all look at Comrade Knight's hair. She got the jewel. It's all bedazzled and stuff like that. She looking real cute. <laughs> Black power, my hair, your hair. You know, I it's mean, a little light, light. You know, <laughs> I had to get my lace front thrown on. You know. I <laughs> mean, <laughs> Black power, comrades. Yes, y'all make sure y'all come on into the room. Please put hashtag shared in the comments when you have shared it. All right. So, welcome to another episode of the Revolutionary Book Trap presented to you by Black. Hammer, it's your boy, Chief Dia Kiese, and my girl, Chief Naya, what's up <laughs> with you? Yes, and y'all know to expect us each and every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here for the Black Hammer Facebook page. Yes, so if you're just joining us, we are in the middle of reading How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, written by Walter Brodney, which has really been a great read up until this Amazing. point. Amazing. Yes, it has been, it's been just like so fantastic and fantastic in terms of, you know, just really uh, uh, being able to contextualize what Europe has been able to do to Africa in the past, mm -hmm. which has direct <coughs> relations to, you know, the condition that Africa is in right now in terms of development and underdevelopment. And um, right now we're up to chapter three. So please, if you're just joining us, Go ahead and click on the PDF link or we got the audio link so you can listen so you don't even have to read. So many options for you. So many options. So, y'all, please just make sure y'all share this video so we can go ahead and get into this discussion. But before we do that, as you already know, what we got coming up, Comrade Naya? So we got uh, the Atlanta-based food drive. Our second one is yes. going to be taking place on January the 18th at 11 a.m. We're going to be meeting up at Woodruff and Hertz Park mm -hmm. in the area. So if you're in Atlanta and you want to help us um, get that set up, please hit us up so we can get you involved. Uh, we are taking donations yes. at uh, the Cash App Black Hammer Org, dollar sign Black Hammer Org. I think the links are there. Um, we also have the Orlando uh, Food Drive, mm -hmm. and that's taking place. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> we have events set up. I want to say it's January the 25th. Um, I have the event saved on my page. Why are you pulling that up, Conrad Naya? I do like how you slipped in there that we are raising donations for the homeless food drive. So today, we, as we do every Sunday, well, I think this is, we only have one more episode of the Revolutionary Book Trap before we do the uh, food drive. And so today, we have a goal of raising $75 for this episode of Revolutionary Book Trap. So like Conrad Naya said, Please go to the cash sign, uh, I'm sorry, cash app, cash sign, 
Black Camel, or you can donate through there. You can also go to blackcamera.org, donate. You can also go to gofundme.com slash blackcamera.org to <laughs> donate. So today, we're going to raise $75. Yep. So you can do this two ways. You can donate immediately. Again, just go to any of the links provided. Or you can make a pledge, meaning that you can tell us what amount you want to donate today and then provide a date that you can provide it. And then we will definitely follow up with you to get your donation in, okay? And, Black power. Uh, uh, uh. Black power. <laughs> and the Orlando uh, Clothes and Hygiene uh, hygiene Drive is going to be Saturday, January 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at Pine Hills, Orlando. Yes. So, and they are taking donations at dollar sign BH Florida. So you can send your donations to that particular fundraiser there. Black power. Also want to give a special shout out to all of the comrades in the Atlanta unit. We had a very great outreach session yesterday. We were able to visit some of the local grocery stores here within the city and make some meaningful connections. So we'll be following up with them during this week to get, uh, you know, to get donations in for the food drive as well, too. So, yeah. Please go ahead and put your pledges in or go ahead and put the amount that you want to donate in so we can go ahead and reach our goal of $75 today. You think we can do it, Carmen? I know we can do it because we, we bad. We bad. We bad. We bad. <laughs> All right, y'all. So let's go ahead and jump into this discussion. So we are now on Chapter 3, and Chapter 3 is entitled Africa's Contribution to European Capitalist Development, the Pre-Colonial Period. And and so he starts this chapter out with some quotes, and I just want to read one really quickly. And it states, if you were to lose each year, um, yeah, if you were to lose each year more than 200 million lot levers that you now get from your colonies, if you had not the exclusive trade with your colonies to feed your manufacturers, to maintain your navy, to keep your agriculture going, to repay for your imports, to provide for your luxury needs, to advantageously balance your trade with Europe and Asia, then I say it clearly. The king would be a, um, what is that comrade? Irretrievably. Irretrievably lost. And this statement comes from Bishop Murray of France, Argument, listen to this, argument against France ending the slave trade and giving freedom to its slave colonies presented in the French National Assembly in 1791. 1791. So here you have this bishop that is saying outright that if Europe didn't have access to exploiting African labor, if it didn't have access to stealing the resources from Africa, they, the economy would be lost. It would be non-existent. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, we have so many in this chapter, he lays out so many different, different examples, but for this to come from someone who you could imagine is, has such a prominent position in, you know, mm -hmm. European capitalist society, I yep. mean, it's just very telling of how you know how um, how vicious and how um, well how vested yeah that's who yeah exactly in the slave trade exactly exactly so he begins this chapter by stating that development and underdevelopment help each other by interaction meaning that pre pretty much in simpler terms. Europe would not have been able to develop if it did not underdevelop Africa. Right. And he also goes on to say that, um, what, did, what does he say? Western Europe, Western Europe and Africa the, uh, relationship ensured transfer of wealth, which made, uh, po which made possible, uh, I'm sorry, Hold on, y'all. Y'all know my uh, notes is all I put up here. Hello. Hey, good morning, good morning. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> See, we live, y'all. We, we live. Any, any, anything can anything happen on camera, happen. okay? <laughs> okay, so yeah. So he pretty much says that... Uh, 
development, development and underdevelopment, in order for any of them to transpire, there had to be some type of interaction. And so mainly what we see is Western Europe and Africa had a relationship mm -hmm. which ensured the transfer of wealth from Africa to Europe. So this is where the basis of development and underdevelopment comes from. So he also goes on to say, the transfer was possible only was was possible only after uh, trade had become truly international, and it was another line that I wanted. I thought I wrote it down. Hold on, let me see if I can find it. Oh my gosh! Why don't I? It's not this one, is it? The developed and underdeveloped parts of the present capitalist section of the world have been in continuous contact for four and a half centuries. The contention here is that over the over that period, Africa helped to develop Western Europe in the same proportion that Western Europe helped to underdevelop mm -hmm. Africa. Say it one more time. Okay, okay, I'll read it more, more pronounced. <laughs> the developed and underdeveloped parts of the present capitalist section of the world have been in continuous contact for four and a half centuries. Mm -hmm. The contention here is that over the period, Africa helped to develop Western Europe in the same proportion as Western Europe helped help to underdevelop Africa. So by keeping Africa in its undeveloped state mm -hmm. so that it could extract wealth from it exactly. is its is the same benefit as Africa basically sending out the wealth that it had. So mm -hmm. it, its dependence, its underdevelopment basically meant the overdevelopment of or Europe. advanced development yeah, of Europe. Exactly. So an another major part of this chapter is about the world trade system. Mm. And Brother Wadney extensively goes into laying out how this came to be. And he, one example he gives is that what was called international trade was nothing but the extension overseas of European interests. Mm -hmm. The strategy behind international trade and the production that supported it was firmly in, the, uh, in European hands and specifically in the hands of seagoing nations from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And what's so inter... Well, I'm going to get into that. I'm going to get into that later. I'm going to get into that later. So, um, yeah. So, you, we, we are already able to establish that international trade is in the hands of Europeans in, in uh, Europe. So, at the same time, Africans aren't aware of the tri-continental links of Africa, Europe, and the Americas. So even with Europe conducting, you know, trade with Africa, Africans at this point aren't aware that Europe is already trading with Africa, they're trading in Europe, and they're also trading in the Americas. And what, uh, what makes this contradiction so steep is the fact that Europe had a monopoly of knowledge about the international exchange system. They so, set the laws. Mm -hmm. They set everything mm -hmm. in place. And then not to mention, they dirty asses was already <laughs> on the sea, you know, going to different places and, and basically killing off, you know, exactly. people. Exactly. And so he also, he provides some examples um, behind this. And I wanna, I'm gonna read some. So he says, Africans had little clue as to, tri -con as to the tri-continental links between Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Europe had a monopoly of knowledge about the international exchange system seen as a whole for Western Africa, I mean, I'm sorry, for Western Europe was the only sector capable of viewing the system as a whole. Yep. So you can't, you, you can't speak to anything else without being able to acknowledge that because that forms the basis of international trade. So he says, Europeans used the superiority of their ships and cannon to gain control of the world's waterways, starting with the Western Mediterranean and the Atlantic coast of North Africa. From 1415, when the Portuguese captured uh, Quetta named, uh, near Gibraltar. Gibraltar? Gibraltar, I think. Yeah. They maintained the offensive against the Maghreb. Within the next 60 years, they seized ports such as Arzilla, El Carces, 
Sekir and Tangier and fortify them. For the second half of the 15th century, the Portuguese controlled the Atlantic coast of Morocco and used its economic strat uh, strat and strategic advantages to prepare for further navigations, which eventually carried their ships around to the Cape of Flood Hope in 19, I mean, I'm sorry, in 1495. So, all of this time from night from 1415 to 1495, Europeans were able to fortify their naval, their naval, um, I don't want to, well, their naval base, I guess you could say, or like naval, their vessels and things of that nature. Yep. So this is how, you know, Europeans were able to become so prominent in terms of the international, um, in terms of the international uh, trade system. So, okay, we have we already have that knowledge right there. So, this is okay, this is why I wanted to raise this point right quick because you know, uh right now the I want y'all to please go over to the Black Hammer Instagram page. Um and shout out to Comrade Ghazi who has just been, you know, on fire on fire with these <laughs> media posts and like as you can see. But the Black Hammer's Instagram is pretty much becoming the revolutionary shade room. And, like, if the, the analysis, 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 <laughs> the analysis is simple, but it's, it's simple in the fact that it makes it easier for us to consume. Yes. Meaning that it's not laden down with all of these, you know, astronomical terms and all of that other type of bullshit. But please go and check it out. So, um, I believe Ghazi, uh, there was a post around, uh, it was a post that came from, um, uh, it was about, what's his name? The man who runs for president right now. Biden? Biden. Making a statement uh, about something about being oh, the, the European identity in, you know, some things of that, something of that nature. Yeah. So I made the comment that. You have this white nationalist pig that is bragging about the European identity as if it's some type of a war. Like, that's something that you should be proud oh, of. Yeah. When the European identity has been consolidated in the field of colonial... No, I said... I'm going to say exactly what I said. The colonial... I mean, the European identity has been consolidated in piss, shit, in colonialism and that cannot be disputed so here it is you have this white liberal so-called marxist person or whatever coming to make some comment um to the nature that um first he accused me of trying to tie the entire white race to capitalism and that basically what he was trying to do was separate the advent of capitalism from the, the consolidation of the European identity. How can you do that? It's not even possible, and I'm gonna tell you why. This is the, and I mean, I can, we, I can go back and forth and say what I say, but you know, I'm, I'm right. a, we're materialists, so exactly. we believe in presenting the facts <laughs> and the receipts. Mm -hmm. And so, Brother Walter lays out clearly, from the beginning, Europe assumed the power to make decisions within the international trading system. An excellent illustration of this is the fact that the so-called international law, which governed the, the conduct of nations on the high seas, was nothing else but European law. Europe and then he also goes on to say, oh no, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I'm going to just stop right there because listen, it's, it's, it's some more tea that I can say I to back up my motherfucking point. But, I mean, even with that statement right there, and then you have to go, let me tell you something. Oh, my God. If there was a whole... Where you, <laughs> where you understand how the whole concept of Europe and the, the whole identity of European, the European identity came into existence. First of all, you have to understand before there was Europe, there was nothing but different warring tribes that you had living in the areas of now what you call Europe. So as European, so-called Europeans are transitioning from feudalism into capitalism, you have to think about the interaction between these, between these two, all of these different warring sects that are warring against each other. 
How were they able to come together to go ahead and, you know, put out these strategies about we're going to sell this place, we're going to go and do all of that other type of shit like that. There had to be the consolidation of a identity. So if we, if they could identify themselves as European, therefore they can go ahead and force their ideologies, their, you know, the, again, essentially the whole system of capitalism upon the rest of the world. Dear. You better, you better <laughs> preach. So how I mean, the hell, how how in the hell can you sit here and see, this is why I don't deal with this Marxist bullshit, okay? Because first of all, you're talking about this this whole Marxist theory or something like that, and that's not to say that uh, Karl Marx did not criticize capitalism because he did. But at the same time, the whole basis of Marx's uh, research was even funded by capitalism. His best friend, his, his best friend's father, who funded his research, owned slaves. So I mean, even from right there, you I mean, even even from right there, Marx's uh uh analysis that's is a, given from it, yes, I it's mean, given from a position on the the, the pillar pedestal. of capitalism. Yes. yes. And then he's then he wants to say then, see I, then he wants to say that my my comments was reactionary. What the fuck was reactionary about any of the facts that was laid out? I mean, you can't, you cannot start at any, you can't start at no basis without acknowledging that. And for, I mean, and for you to even say that just goes to show you like how delusional, delusional these forces can be. Like these white leftist people can be. Oh, um, then he had, <laughs> oh, fuck, girl. So, then he had the nerve to say that uh, that Black Hammer is not an international organization. Oh, really? Go, I'm sorry, comrade. Were, were you getting ready to say something? Yeah, I was, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I mean, so I mean, that just goes to show you how motherfucking baseless <laughs> and just how false, you know, these white leftists come and I, I, I okay, whatever. They're psychopaths. Yeah. <laughs> so again, well, with, with Europe being able to constitute itself as the ruling factor in all of this, and what they were able to do was to decide what role the African economy played in all of this. Mm -hmm. Meaning that they were able to dictate what Africa was able to export. And trade. And trade. And so he says what, what was able to bring Africa into this uh, relationship with Europe is that Africans at this point in time were trading with the Europeans. So it was even in, in this... It's, it's all happening simultaneously. So while European is while Europe is able to dictate what happens in Africa's economy, at the same time, Africa is still actively trading with Europe. So if I'm able to control what goes on to your economy, then you become dependent upon what I'm able to provide to you. And oh, we gotta go. I'm, I'm, I know we're going off. I'm sorry, but we we gotta go, y'all. <laughs> we got a goal this morning of raising seventy five dollars for our homeless food drive that is taking place right here in Atlanta on the eighteenth, and that's awful. That's also happening during the weekend, MLK weekend, the mm -hmm. the weekend of Martin Luther King's birthday, and I think that's another powerful thing for us to be comrades on the ground feeding our our, our homeless brothers and sisters in the city. Where, you know, the, the, this African man that was able to, you know, mobilize hundreds of millions of African people to, you know, at least consciously recognize that we needed to change our situation here as, you know, Africans trapped in colonialism and yes. white imperialism here in America. Now, I mean, you know, we understand that in some terms... The work that was done by Martin Luther King Jr., um, you know, I want to say that it was not contradictory, but it was like elementary in terms of the development of the consciousness of the development for Africans here in, you know, America to understand that, no, we didn't need to integrate into this white capitalist system. We needed to, you know, pretty much destroy it. But what we can say is that 
Mar the, the contribution that Martin Luther King Jr. made to the overall liberation struggle is pretty substantial. And that has to be acknowledged. And then just also recognizing that at the later half of his life, Martin Luther King Jr. began to really understand, you know, what America was. And I mean, so yeah, we're going to be doing it on the 18th, that Saturday from 11 to, to no, I'm two. sorry, from 12, is it 11? Okay, 11, yeah, 11, 11 to 2, I'm sorry, yes. So please, go ahead, put your pledges in the comments, just let us know how much you can donate, when you plan on donating it, or just go directly to... Uh, cash app, dollar sign, Black Hammer Org, or you can go to blackhammerorg.com, or you can go to gofundme.com slash blackhammerorg. So go ahead, make your donations today. So, I see you smiling. I just have a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just so full of love right now. <laughs> like everything that you just said. But then I also wanted to point out something that you said. First of all, that was my read that back. Mm -hmm. I wanted to point that out. And then secondly, um, you had mentioned that Europeans basically were able to dictate the role that Africans had, that African people had in the slave trade, mm -hmm. and they also dictated the quality of goods that they were able to trade exactly. with them. And I think that's really important because exactly. they, you know, they weren't going to give them the best of the best guns or mm -hmm. the best of the best uh, goods. They were mm -hmm. going to give them things that were like, uh, you know, behind in technology, so they really mm -hmm. wouldn't have a. I mean, they didn't want them to be militarily ready to, to fight them if they nope. found out what was really happening. Um, so I think that was really important. And then just to go on, where he talks about how Africans did not participate in its making, talking about the international law of trade. Mm -hmm. And in many instances, African people were simply the victims, for the law recognized them only as transportable merchandise. Um, so they were not only a uh, participant, but they were like the actual product that was going out of the fucking continent. If the African slave trade, if, if the African slave was thrown aboard at sea, the only legal problem that arose was whether or not the slave ship could claim compensation for the from the insurance. So you insurance, like how are we going to get that money back to to for this work that we just threw overboard? Above, above all, Af <laughs> European decision-making exercise in selecting what Africa should export in mm. accordance with at European needs. Mm. A, co a commodity. Mm. A commodity. Mm. That is exactly mm. what this, mm. this whole land became, including its people. Say it, Naya. Say it. And then, even, I want to say that uh, Walter Rodney... Um, you know, even makes it a point to even say what started off to be the main thing that attracted to that attracted Europeans to Africa, which in many uh, in many ways he says is gold. He says Europeans were anxious to acquire gold in Africa mm -hmm. because there was a pressing need for gold coin within the yeah. growing capitalist money economy. Mm -hmm. Now this is okay. Listen, listen, listen to this. Since gold was limited to very small areas of Africa, as far as Europeans were then aware, the principal export was human beings. Yes. Europe allocated to Africa the role of supplier of human captives to be used as slaves in various parts of the world. So don't you ever come out of your motherfucking mouth talking about some Europeans don't have any Europeans, white people don't have anything to do with the consolidation of capitalism as a global world system. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Mm -hmm. mm. 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 So after that, I mean, I mean, <laughs> He goes into when uh, Europeans reached their Americas, and he says that what, what they recognized in America was the potential for gold and silver in tropical produce. But the potential could not be made a reality without adequate labor supplies. So this, in turn, now he goes into how pretty much America was consolidated. How America came into being, which we already know, and we don't unite with that false-ass narrative of Colum Christopher Columbus discovering America and how he met with the Indians and they taught him how to grow corn and all of this other fairy tale fictional bullshit. So now we're going to get to the true nitty-gritty to the truth. And he says... 
the indigenous Indian population could not withstand new European. And see, girl, this, he don't even, the first thing he says is not even weaponry. He's not saying how the Europeans he were said, able to come and attack them. Tell him what he's saying, Conrad. He said they were dirty. He <laughs> said that, he, they see that he said their asses were dirty. He said new <laughs> European diseases such as smallpox, could, could, nor could they bear the organized toil of slave plantations slave mines and having barely emerged from the hunting stage. But the first thing out of their mouth was new Europe. European diseases. Don't this you. is how Europe was able to infiltrate the Americas. That, and then he says, that is why the islands like Cuba and Hispan Hispaniola, the local Indian populations were virtually wiped out by their white invaders because of the Virtually wiped out. That means that they had to take them from Imagine you have a certain amount of people and taking them down to less than 10% of the population mm -hmm. that was, that was mm -hmm. there originally. Mm -hmm. And just so, that, just so we're clear, just so we're clear, this is what called the need, this is what created the basis for Europe to make Africa this market for selling black bodies. Because they went to America, to the Americas, pretty much wiped out the indigenous population and because also European at this time was a very small population. Right. So them, they themselves could not carry out the labor that they needed to bring the full potential to be, to, 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 I, well, yeah, to manifest the full potential that they so-called uh, saw in the Americas. Mm. So therefore, as Brother Walter Rodney says, Africa, which incidentally had a population of cus Nazi. Oh God! What made Africa so ideal to become this warren of black skins for the sale of black skins is the fact that you got to understand that prior to European invasion, we already talked about how African people were already the forerunners of agriculture, of yep. being able to herd cattle in the, the domestication of animals. Yep. So if you already have these, if you already have you know, a continent of people that are familiar with working the land, that are familiar with raising domestic animals and things of all the things of that nature. This is this is how the this is how the Europeans viewed Africa's I mean African and Af Africans in Africa. Who sound lazy to y'all? <laughs> <laughs> but we need to, but we need to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and all of this other type of, yeah. yeah. So welcome, we... Kendrick. Thank you for joining us. Black power, Black power comrade Kendrick. So I want to salute my comrade Naya and just say that this sister has, you know, just. Really well. First of all, we've had people reach out to us about being able to participate in the Revolutionary Book Club that did not have access to Facebook. So we are now utilizing our call-in number for you know our African brothers and sisters again who don't have access to Facebook to call in and participate in this discussion. So that goes to say, if you have friends or family members who you know would be interested in participating in the book club but don't have access to Facebook, we can definitely provide you with the call-in number where you can call in and listen to the discussion and even offer your commentary or you know any points of discussion as well too. My comrade be on it. She be on it. She be on it. <laughs> so, um, Black Power. <laughs> Black Power. So, again, at this point, Europe is being able to tell uh, Africans what it is that they can export. Mm -hmm. And then Comrade uh, Walter goes on to say that it would be a mistake because what is pretty much generally believed, you know, by white people and by some black people <coughs> is that when the Europeans came to Africa, that they overwhelmed us with like weaponry and things of that nature, that they were able, they came with their guns and all this other kind of stuff like that. But that's not true. That is not true. How, and just, I mean, we spoke to the point earlier that Africans at this point in time were engaging with trade uh, was enga engaging in trade with Europeans who are coming to Africa. So at this same time, you have to understand that Africans are currently, African societies 
are in this transitional period from communalism to feudalism. We already spoke about, you know, the different contradictions that we saw between the pastoralists and the cultivators and things of that nature. And also that these African societies, most of them did not reach the development of what you call, you know, the state. And we understand that when a state was able to uh, come into being, right. that dictated your economy, your trade systems, how you interacted with other African societies. So we already have the understanding that at this point in time, the African societies were, we weren't really exchanging, you know, interacting with each other. So Walter Rodney goes on to say that this is how Europeans were able to play upon that. Yep. Uh, you know, yeah. there was no consolid. Yeah, there was pretty much no, uh, no uh, interaction between these African societies. And he makes this point where he says, European power resided in their system of production, which was at somewhat at a higher level than Africa's at that time. European society was leaving feudalism and was moving towards capitalism. African society was then entering a phase comparable of feudalism, which we have already discussed. And this is where he drives the points drive the points home. He says, the fact that Europe was the first part of the world to move from feudalism towards capitalism gave Europeans a head start over humanity elsewhere in the scientific understanding of the universe, the making of tools, and the efficient organization of labor. European <laughs> technical superiority did not apply to all aspects of production, but the advantage which they possessed in a few care, uh, cute, uh, areas pro uh, proved uh, de decisive. De mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Then he also goes on to, okay, so there we have that point right there. So this, going back to what we were just speaking about earlier, right. about uh, you know Africans participating in trade with uh, Europeans. So here you have Europeans who come, you know, with all of these, you know, different techn technical advantages and things of that nature. So, oh my God, like just the understanding you get when you, just, when you. It's laden with mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. fundamental reason why mm -hmm. capitalism exists mm -hmm. and what, you know, white quote unquote superiority mm -hmm. in the way they dominate everything mm -hmm. it's just laden with that and mm -hmm. when you read when you understand that you mm -hmm. understand a lot mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. lot mm -hmm. and it's, it's mm -hmm. just every i mean every bit of this chapter is just so important yeah and so he says that because europe you know had all of these you know technical advantages and things of Okay, so this is, okay, so as you understand, as these African societies are transitioning into these elementary phases of feudalism, you have to understand that that comes with class stratification. And class stratification comes with the, the, with the producing of the ruling class in that society. So now you have the African monarchies, the kings and things of that, the African kings and things of that nature. So, with class stratification and, you know, the creating of the ruling class, you have to understand that that ruling class now has an interest. And that interest lies in the development of the economy for that specific, and we can even say in terms, in, uh, you know, just for specifics, in terms of that specific African society. So if you have a king, an African king that is vested into the European trading economy, Understand what I'm saying? This is going to create the basis for Europeans to say, "Hey, if you want my if you want my Euro, if you want my European trade goods, you're going to have to give me your people." Mm -hmm. So I can make this labor happen. And mm -hmm. you can't underestimate that. And then just the fact that you, it's this this perceived notion that it was the majority of these African societies that were doing such a thing, which was completely not true because also what he says in here that, let's see. Okay, here it is. I'm a receipts type of girl, okay? <laughs> let, me read, let me read my receipts. African rulers found European goods sufficiently, sufficiently desirable 
to hand over captives which they had taken in warfare. So even that says that the, these African rulers were not out here actively round, rounding up African people Just to sell to, to uh, yeah, 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 to sell to, um, to sell to Europeans. It's so many different epiphanies that they that were just like, they were yeah. just greedy and that they wanted to just give African people, you know, African people away. That's the other misconception mm -hmm. that, we're that we're continuously told is that y'all sold yourselves into slavery. So mm -hmm. you're just as accountable mm -hmm. for what happened to you as anything, as anything the Europeans would have done. So he goes on to say, soon war began to be fought between one community and another for the sole purpose of getting prisoners for sale to europeans and even inside a given community a ruler might be tempted to exploit his own subjects and capture them for sale so even in that understanding that speaks to the interest of the that uh african monarchy mm -hmm. and he says uh what does he say a train reaction was started by European demand for slaves and only slaves and by their, off and by their offer of consumer go uh, goods. This process being connected with divisions within African society. It is often said for the colonial period that vertical political divisions in Africa, uh, in the Africa made conquest easy. This is even truer of the way that Africa succumbed to the slave trade. National unification was a product of mature feudalism and of capitalism. Inside Europe, there were far fewer political divisions than in Africa, where communalism meant political fragmentation with families with the family as the nu nucleus, and there were only a few states that had real territorial uh, solidarity. Furthermore, when one European nation challenged another to obtain captives from an African ruler, Europe benefited from whichever of the two nations won the conflict. So, I mean, oh my God, this, is, this even goes to, uh, this goes to the present proxy wars that we see happening in Today. Africa right now. How Europeans have been able to come into Africa and pit one tribe against the other. What we're going over now is the basis of all of that, even of what we're seeing right now in, tw in the year 2020. I, I wanna read some of these comments because we have quite a few. Uh, Alex uh, said his read that, read that back was in the simplest of societies where there were no kings. It provide, it proved impossible for Europeans to strike up an alliance, which was necessary to carry on the trade and captives on the coast. If Europeans could unite under imperialist colonialism, only pan-African unity can resolve colonization. And then there was something else he said later that I wanted to make sure that we clarify. He said, um, when we were speaking about when they came to the Americas and mm -hmm. they inflicted what they did on the indigenous people, they said that's the one, that's actually the one point which I highly disagree with, brother Rod, uh, brother Rodney. Uh, the indigenous Indian population could not withstand new European diseases such as smallpox, nor could they bear the organized toil of slave plantations and slave mines, having barely emerged from the hunting stage. It implies that indigenous folks died because their society was not advanced enough. And I think that uh, there, Alex. Um, I do think that as far as like, I was focusing more on the disease, the fact that they brought disease, which is very well documented. Mm -hmm. I mean, even they say that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that it was, you know, because in African societies, we had, you know, we were advancing into something comparable to feudalism. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to present that this book is about where the indigenous people were with their developmental yeah. stage. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's fair for me to do that or for us to do that reading this text. Mm -hmm. um, however, I do think that it's very um, important to focus on the fact that when the Europeans reached the American, the American lands, that their presence there their their disease ridden cells were there to such a degree that they were able just it with that by itself mm -hmm. and even if those people were able to to work under normal conditions <clears throat> mm -hmm. or had advanced they had been made sick to the point where maybe they couldn't work in those conditions and then also even beyond that at the most simplest basis because of course we understand that the indigenous population of the Americas were thri was thriving mm -hmm. for millennia, for millennia. 
but I don't think we can overlook the fact that Europeans traveled from a whole nother part of the world. And you're talking about Europeans bringing diseases to mm -hmm. indigenous populations that had already developed, you know, their own medical systems to, you know, to cure diseases that, you know, came about in their natural habitat. Right. developing medications that spoke to their specific needs because what the Europeans brought to the indigenous population was something that they had never even experienced before. So I think we have to also take that into consideration and that is not to, you know, definitely yeah. a downgrade the, the, the you know, um, the development in the, uh, of the indigenous population, yeah. but they were faced with something that they had never interacted with before. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even that's like, for example, so Africans, um, you know, Africans born in America who, and I think they even, it's, it's like a, a process that you have to go through. Like if, even traveling from different parts of the world, you can't even drink, you know, some parts of the water, you know, in Africa, being that your body isn't accustomed to, you know, um, I guess the water there and you can, you can actually get sick, right. you know, so that's why they um, advise you to drink like bottled water and things of that nature. But yeah, I don't think what, I don't think what he's saying is undermining, um, you know, the, the advancements of, um, you know, the indigenous populations here. So, um, okay, yeah. So, uh, just continuing, you know, and on the basis of, you know, how Africa was, you know, pulled into this whole relationship of uh, slave trade and things of that nature, Walter Rodney also goes on to say that the rulers had a certain status in authority. And when bamboozled by European goods, they began to use their position to raid outside societies as well as to exploit internally by victimizing some of their own subjects. I'm sorry, um, come, sorry about that, comrade. Okay, so now this is where he leads and to take us to, um, what did he say? Uh, let me get to my handy damn notes. Well, just, uh, I mean, so they're basically, I mean, to what I was grabbing from that was just the for like, you know, you'd already touched on it, but just like the forcing of these different societies to have to participate in the export of humans, uh, human beings mm -hmm. out of the, out of the continent. Mm -hmm. And like, even when those that did try to resist that movement, mm -hmm. The surrounding, and I think it goes into it a little bit later. I'm not sure if we've gotten there yet, but when they're talking about the Angolan state of Mataba on the oh yeah, that's what I was getting ready to go yeah into. yeah yeah. So well, it's my page eighty. Mm -hmm. The Angolan state of Mataba on the river Qu uh, River Quango was founded around 1630 as a direct reaction against the Portuguese, mm -hmm. which Queen Zinga at its head, Mateva tried to coordinate resistance against the Portuguese in Angola. However, Portu uh, Portugal gained the upper hand in 1648, and this left Mateva isolated. Mateva could not forever stand aside, so as long as it opposed the trade with the Portuguese, it was an object of hostility from neighboring African states. Mm -hmm. Uh, which had compromised with, with Europeans and slave trading. So in 1656, Queen Zinga resumed business with the Portuguese, a major concession to the decision-making role of Europeans within the Angola. So it's like they dominated, and, and like you had already said, they used the different states and played them against each mm -hmm. other. And then once they gained the upper hand with the surrounding states, even one state that was within that area that tried to resist that, mm -hmm. they didn't really have a way to trade or yeah. barter with even the neighboring states and between they, and themselves. Then, uh, like you said, they faced hostility yeah. from you know other states that were, again, compromising with um, Europeans. And then, well, he goes on to just, you know, lay out other examples of African resistance, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, to what was happening. And next he talks about uh, the Baga people, Baga people, in what is now in the Republic of Guinea. That's how you pronounce it? Guinea. That? Guinea. Yeah. So he says, the Baga lived in small states, and in about 1720, one of their leaders, Toba by the name, aimed at securing an alliance to stop the slave traffic. 
He was defeated by local European resident traders, mulattoes, and other slave trader trading Africans. It is not difficult to understand why Europeans should have taken immediate steps to see that Tomba and his Baga followers did not opt out of the role allocated to them by Europe. A parallel which presents itself in the manner in which Europeans got together to wage the Opium War against mm. China in the 19th century to ensure the Western capitalists would make profit while the Chinese were turned into dope addicts. And another prominent, uh, another prominent uh, African that he speaks of that opposed the European slave trade was the da Dahomey. I think that's it. Yeah. So he says in the 1720s, the Homini opposed European slave traders and were deprived of European imports, some of which had become necessary at the time. Uh, Agaja. Uh, Agaja Trudeau, the Homini's greatest king, appreciated the European demand for slaves in the pursuit of slaving in around the Homini was in conflict with the Homini's development. Between 1724 and 1726, he looted and burned European forts and slave camps, and he reduced the trade from the slave coast to a mere trickle by blocking the paths leading to sources of supply in, in the interior. European slave traders were very, bit, very bitter, and they tried to sponsor some African collaborators against Agaja, mm -hmm. Agaja Trudeau. So even girl, even back then you had some sellouts. Even back then you had some sellouts. Mm -hmm. They failed to unseat him or to crush the the Homian state, but in turn, um, Agaja. Agaja failed to persuade them to develop new lines of economic activity, such as local plantation agriculture, and being anxious to acquire firearms and cowries through the Europeans, he had to agree to the uh, resum resumption of slave trading in 1730. So, just like we said in the beginning of this whole discussion, European Europe had already been able to dictate what was going on in the African economy. So if Africans weren't able to create their own weapons and trade amongst each other, then you had to depend on the Europeans who were bringing in the muskets, the cannons, and all kind of stuff like that. And also, because Africa was in this underdeveloped state, they had, they had no, uh, whatchamacallit, no, they had no real, no real pushback. Mm -hmm. Because, again, everything that was in the African economy was being exported to Europe. Yep. So at, uh, as all of this is happening, and then, I mean, like, again, all of these African societies are going through this transitional period. So there isn't time to, you know, establish, like, a pretty much manufacturing your own, your own goods, your own uh, consumer goods that you need within the continent. So now you have to depend on Europeans who tell you that if you don't trade your people for the necessities, then pretty much your survival is like, mm -hmm. you can't, you won't be able to survive. Not to mention, you know, they're there dictating even the relationships that are forming, that are able to be formed between African states or tribes or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So if they don't want just like today, just take for example, one of the first things they'll tell you is you guys don't have anything in common with continental Africans. They mm -hmm. can't stand you. Um, how much of a threat would it be if we actually formed alliances? But they know that that's an issue. Mm -hmm. They know that there would be an issue with the, us all, you know, Africans all over the diaspora, wherever Africans are, if we were to actually form an alliance true internationalism mm -hmm. and actually, you know, what the, you know, was like, yeah, no, enough of y'all, we're going to come together and do this. Mm -hmm. Um, so they use that as a, as a weapon to keep trade between states and things like that. It made them totally dependent on mm -hmm. Europeans, <clears throat> um, for that. And oh, like continuing on in the chapter, uh, Walter Rodney makes, brings up the point that you know, these bourgeois capitalist uh, scholars or whatever, you know, the white thinking intellectuals mm -hmm. who are able to produce these different ideologies that, you know, are adopted by, 
you know, um, you know, white imperialism, pretty much that goes to only uh, solidify their, uh, what do you say? How do you say? Like, not necessarily belief, but, you know, just to reaffirm that what they're doing is, you know, pretty much right. And he goes on to say that they tried to put out this narrative that pretty much what we saw in the development in Europe, in Europe was entrepreneurial. Uh -huh. That <laughs> these Europeans were nothing but entrepreneurs. And that is how and they pretty should, much... And we should seek to be like them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So after he makes that point, and this is why this, is, this, this information is very extensive, and I just really want to encourage all of our trappers, hashtag trappers, trappers. <laughs> our trappers, that you have to, you, you really have to dwell, dwell into, into this. And so this is how Brother Walter Rodney is able to dispel this whole narrative. And people, you know, like Europeans, you know, white people today want to tell us to forget slavery, to forget the past, and all of these different things like that, when what happened in the past is directly a result of what we know as human what we know as human society to be today, like how all of these things, how all of these different institutions have come into being today. So there is no way for you to forget what happened in the past because it has direct ties to what is happening now in the future. And this is how Comrade Rodney is able to lay this out. So he says, Central and South American gold and silver mined by Africans played a crucial role in meeting the need for coin in the expanding capitalist uh, money economy of Western Europe, while African gold helped the Portuguese finance further navigations around the Cape of Good Hope and into Asia from the 15th century on. African gold was also the main source of the mintage of Dutch gold coin in the 17th centuries, helping Amsterdam become the financial capital of Europe in that period. And in further, it was no coincidence that when the English struck a new gold coin in 1663, they called it Guinea. The Encyclopedia Britannica explains that, that the guinea was a gold coin at one time current in the United Kingdom. It was first coined in 1663 in the reigns of Charles II from gold imported from the Guinea coast of West Africa by a company of merchants trading under the, uh, the charter of the British crown. Hence the name. I ain't even done yet. We're not even done yet. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries and most of the 19th century, the, ex the exploitation of Africa and African labor continued to be a source for the accumulation of capital to be reinvested into Western Europe. The African contribution to European capitalist growth extended over such vital sectors of shipping, insurance, insurance the formation of companies, Capitalist agriculture, technical technical uh, technology, and the manufacture of machinery. So literally everything that we use today, banking systems, insurance companies, your ancestors' blood was tied into it. I need I need you guys to fat like really grasp what is being laid out here because like Wells Fargo. I mean like these. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody Your heard blood. of the have you heard of the Barclays Bank? Has anybody heard of the Barclays Bank? And so we have this example. Extending examples are provided in the persons of David and Alexander Barclay, who were engaging in the slave trade in 1756 and later used the loot to set up Barclays Bank. There was a similar progression in the case of Lloyd's, from being a small London coffee house to being one of the world's greatest banking and insurances houses after dipping into profits from slave trade and slavery. Then there was James Watts expressing external, and I'm, I'm sorry, internal, internal 
gratitude to the West Indian slave owners who directly financed his factual steam engine and took it from the drawing board to the factory. Even the production of chocolate today, that's, that's African slave labor. Child, African child slave labor to be exact. <laughs> Now we got to get into, because now that we understand that that is happening on a global scale, we can now, we can speak to what, how, uh, how the Americas were affected directly. So listen to this. Europe transferred. Listen, listen to this. So this is, so you can understand the basis of your oppression and, colon and colonized existence as an African, African stolen to America. Europe transferred its capitalist institutions more completely to North America than in any part of the goal, globe, I'm sorry, and established a powerful form of capitalism. After eliminating the indigenous inhabitants and exploiting the labor of millions of Africans, like other parts of the New World, the American colonies of the British crown were used as a means of accumulating primary capital for re-export to Europe. But the northern colonies also had direct access to benefits from slavery in the American South and in the British and French West Indies. As in Europe, the profits made from slavery and slave trade went firstly to commercial port, per, uh, ports excuse me, in industrial areas, which meant mainly the northeastern seaboard district known as New England and the state of New York. Go ahead, cover. No, no, no. Okay. I was just <laughs> right. Was just American pitching. economic development up to mid 19th century rested squarely on foreign commerce of which slavery was at the pivot. In the 1830s, slave-grown cotton accounted for about half of the value of all exports from the United States of America. Get into this. For instance, in New England, trade with Africa, Europe and the West Indies and slaves and slave-grown products supplied cargo for their merchant marine, stimulated the growth for their shipbuilding industry, built up their towns and their cities, and enabled them to utilize the forest, fisheries, and soil more efficiently. I'm, not, I'm sorry, more effectively. Finally, it was the carrying trade between the West Indian slave colonies in Europe which lay behind the emancipation of, of, of oh my God lay behind the emancipation of American colonies from British rule and it was no accident that the struggle for American independence started in the leading New England town of Boston. There was something else I wanted to go back to when, you, when we finish this section, because I want to make sure that we do dissect this really well, but... Mm. Um, then we already went over, but this is the last point that I, I, that I at least want to make, Conrad and I, I'm, I'm not sure if you have any more commentary. I, yeah. <clears throat> because you know, for a long time now, and because we understand that the history books have been being whitewashed and you already have all of these different, you know, ideologies based in white imperialism that has been forced upon, our, uh, forced upon us. And of course, we already see how the, the whole, you know, the history of slavery in America has been painted as, you know, Africans coming to America as indentured servants, African slavery not being as hard on uh, Africans, and, you know, just pretty much just whitewashing the history of slavery, <clears throat> not only in America, but pretty much all the way around the world. And a, a, a major component of that is based on the Civil War. Because for so long it has been pushed that 
the Civil War was fought to free the slaves in America. That the North is some type of progressive, you know, the Northern states were progressive and they frowned upon, you know, slavery and things of that nature. So let's go ahead and dispel all of that bullshit. Slavery is useful for early accumulation of capital, but it is too rigid for industrial development. Slaves had to be given crude, non-breakable tools which held back the capitalist development of agriculture and industry. That explains the fact that the northern portions of the United States gained far more industrial benefits from slavery than the South, which actually had slave institutions on its soil. And ultimately, the stage was reached in the American Civil War when the northern capitalists fought to end slavery within the boundaries of the United States so that the country as a whole could advance to higher to a higher level of capitalism. So Dia, are you reading that the freedom of chattel slaves in America had nothing to do with the humanitarianism aspect of it, but more so just for the benefit of capitalism in America? Is that what you're saying? Girl, that's exactly what I'm saying. Oh, okay. And to even further that point, <laughs> in effect, one can say that within the United States, the slave relations in the South had by the second half of the 19th century come into conflict with the further expansion of the productive base inside the United States as a whole. And a violent clash ensued before the capitalist relations for legally free labor became generalized. Oh my God. Black power. Uh. Yeah, we could go on and on about that. I wanted to actually just make a point before we close out about, um, you know, there are people that still try to quantify the monetary profits or the financial gains from, for the Europeans, you know, and what they got from slavery. And on page 83, I thought it was important to mention here, um, and I'll say why in a minute, but some attempts have been made to quantify the actual uh, monetary profits made by Europeans from engaging in the slave trade. The actual dimensions are not easy to affix, but the profits are fat, were fabulous. John Hopkins made three trips to West Africa in 1560s and stole Africans from um, whom he sold to the Spanish in America. On returning to England after the first trip, his profit was so handsome that Queen Elizabeth I <laughs> became interested in directly participating in his next venture. And she provided for that purpose a ship named Jesus. Hawkins left with the Jesus <laughs> to steal some more Africans. And he returned to England with such dividends that Queen Elizabeth made him a knight. Hawkins chose as his coat of arms the representation of an African in slaves. And the reason I, I you know, I thought it was important to read that in the Queen Elizabeth of today is a direct descendant. descendant of that. So, you know, this Meghan Markle character that married into that family and how that would benefit Africans, even if she were somebody who identified heavily with her African lineage. I'm not really sure what that means for the benefit of Africans marrying into the royal family when their, when their direct, <laughs> they were a direct uh, beneficiary of the slave labor that was that was being exploited and, and taken from the African continent. I don't really know what that means. I don't know how that means. And, I, and that's the first place I also read about, I heard about the Jesus ship, but that's also like, so y'all, I'm not gonna say that because, but I mean, just, you know, the fact that this ship was given for that particular purpose. I mean, that has a whole new uh, meaning about Jesus to me. Mm -hmm. But um, I thought that was important to read. Black power, extremely important. And in closing, I just want to say that, you know, it's just so much in discussion that you can, there's just so much you can pick up from the discussion that is being carried out, you know, between me and Conrad and I and yourselves in the comments, you know, in terms of, you know, this book. But I think what 
what what has to be understood and encouraged is that we really take the time to read because i mean there's just so many other points that could be made you know within this chapter that me and conrad naya you know didn't go into and at some point you know you know we understand that we're providing political education but another part of political education is being able to read and conduct the you know conduct the research on your own terms and i say that to say request the pdf request the audiobook so you can really get into this material because again what we just what brought to Rodney just laid out in this chapter just pretty much contextualized the whole basis of how not only Africa came into this relationship with Europe but how the European the whole how Europe was able to make capitalism a global system and just the whole, set you know, the set up for their benefit alone. Set up for their benefit alone. And the 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 relationship, the 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 oppression, the colonialism that we as Africans face here in America. And the fact that there would literally be no economy. There would be no technology. And this, this, this is the literal truth. This is the literal truth. Literally. Literally. America would, in America and Europe in period, would not be in existence today if it was not for the enslavement of African people. The very McDonald's that you go into, the grocery stores that you go into, the insurance companies that you go into, the technical stores like Apple and Microsoft, to the people who manufacture your noodles, your rice, your milk, your eggs, your bread, your clothing, the toothpaste that you use to brush your teeth, the materials that go into that tooth that to that create the toothbrush. Your pharmaceuticals. Your pharmaceuticals, the very device that you're watching us on right now, without slavery, without the enslavement of African people, would not even exist right now. So when you you can tell. I mean, literally, your the blood of our ancestors are tied into every aspect of this global economy that we see. And we have a historical economy right here. Like, 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 on some real shit, on some real shit, white people owe you the motherfucking shirts off of their backs. Literally. 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 And I'm not saying that in some sense of black nationalism. I'm saying that in the way to motivate you to understand that this is why you have to participate in the revolutionary work. This is why you have to get organized. This is why you have to extend some portion of your time, some portion of your resources, some portion of your being to the revolution and we that's not saying that's not to overlook the understanding that we are colonized and even in the fact that we aren't able to fully participate in this revolutionary project is because of colonialism is because we're colonized even speaks to the fact that the that white imperialism has designed it that way why they had to salt the earth with drugs why they had to make it a requirement for African fathers not to be in the household for black women to receive benefits from this government. Like that is what all this is tied into. This is the basis of colonialism and white imperialism. So. 
Join oh. Black Hammer. Uh, donate to the Atlanta Unit Food Drive. Donate to uh, the hygiene. Uh, is it a hygiene drive? Mm -hmm. That is happening with our comrades. Shout out to comrades Robert and Clothing Gigi in Orlando. Mm -hmm. Clothing in uh, hygiene. You can only you can only judge a, a revolutionary organization based on its work and what they're doing materially in the world to change the conditions of African people in America. And Black Hammer is doing that shit. Mm -hmm. We are actively doing that shit. So go on to the Black Hammer website. Read our mission statement, our points of unity. Read our articles and get involved. Donate. Become a sustaining member. Donate on a monthly basis to keep the organization afloat. Start or join a chapter wherever you are. I mean, your literal freedom depends on it. And, um, yeah, I mean... What we're seeing, you know, now... Uh, you know, this whole conversation about World War Three, um, you know, and you, a lot of us don't even understand that what's happening in Iran has been going on for years, like for years. And the white imperialism has been able to just keep, you know, the masses of our people so shielded and got it and then just open openly and blatantly just to mislead not only the african you know colon and colonized masses in america but even white people themselves don't even understand the extent of what america has been doing in the middle east but um well, that's a conversation for another time yeah but, i mean our next assignment um Chapter four is pretty lengthy, mm -hmm. so we're going to read and read into chapter four to the subheading, the interlacustrine states. Um, in my book, it's about, the whole chapter is about 50 pages, so we're going to split it up. We're going to split it into two, and we're going to get to that, that section by the next time we come together next. The and in my book, book is from page 106 up to uh, the Eastern Interlacustrine Interlac States. Oop, I probably passed it. Okay, no, no, I didn't. It's <laughs> from 107 to 1. 43. Okay, and then mine is from 95 to 122. Yeah. So it's extensive. That's why it's important that you get your PDF, that you get your audio book, so you are able to participate fully in the discussion. We thank y'all for being on with us today. Um, we look forward to being on next Sunday. Just make sure you go to Cash App, Cash Shine. Uh, Black Hammer Org, donate to the Atlanta Unit Food Drive. Go to GoFundMe.com slash Black Hammer Org or just go to BlackHammer.org and make your donation. donation. Black Power. Black Power. <laughs> Black Power, Kendrick.